Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the UK Brand Show, a very special edition of the UK Brand Show today because we have a special guest, um, someone who is a musician, uh, an artist, a producer, a record label owner, and a curator, a man of many talents, um, Mr. James Lavelle. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit more about James's background in a minute, but first of all, um, I'm going to play something from his band called Uncle. So um, bear with me, and this is something from the man from Uncle First. <laughs> That's uh, James Lavelle and a little bit from Uncle. Um, let me give you a bit of background towards James and his, his music and his talents. Um, he founded the Mowax record label back in 1992 and has been a constant member of the band Uncle. Uncle, also known as Uncle Sounds, uh, was also founded in 1992 by James and this uh, music was originally categorized as trip hop, which is described as a fusion of hip hop and electronica with slower tempos and an atmospheric sound, often incorporating elements of jazz, sound, um, for soul, funk, reggae, dub, R&B, and other forms of electronic music, as well as sampling from movie soundtracks and a range of eclectic sources. The genre was adopted initially by music acts such as Massive Attack, Tricky, Portishead, to name a few. In 1996, Moax released one of electronic music's most celebrated albums, and that was DJ Shadow's seminal introducing. Soon after this, James started work on an album with DJ Shadow under the name Uncle, and the resulting release, Science Fiction, their first album featured collaborations with the Verbs Richard Ashcroft and Radiohead's Tom York. Future groundbreaking Uncle albums featured collaborations with the likes of Massive Attacks, Queens of the Stone Age, and many more. Indeed, he produced the title track for Queens of the Stone Age 2013 album, Like Clockwork, which reached number one on the Billboard 200 and received three Grammy Award nominations. He's a longtime resident DJ, famous nightclub Fabric in London, and has produced a, a number of film soundtracks, including Sexy Beast, starring Ray Winston, and the series for Danny Boyle's TV series Trust, about the abduction of John Paul Getty III and stars Donald Sutherland and Hilary Swank. His career was documented in the 2018 documentary film, The Man from Mowax. James also directed the 2014 edition of the Meltdown Festival at on London's South Bank, following in the footsteps of the likes of David Bowie and curated the 2016 exhibition, Daydreaming with the legendary Stanley Kubrick at Somerset House. He took over the Saatchi Gallery with his 360 degree surreal immersive exhibition experience, which I attended and I was sensationally blown away by that. It was called Beyond the Road. It aimed to stimulate the five senses, sight, sound, touch, smell, and spatial perception and features James's music set amongst artworks and multimedia in a moody, sometimes apocalyptic feel. Beyond the Road also exhibited in Seoul as recent as last year in South Korea. James has a fascination with putting music and art into different environments and perform live shows from everywhere, from huge stadia to Glastonbury to Selfridge's basement of all places, uh, one of my favourite Uncle Nights, by the way, which I'll refer to uh, later, to record stores, to Somerset House, and to the newly reopened multi-sensory outernet venue in central London, something else we'll touch on. So that's James Lavelle. 
Um, I'm so delighted he's come to talk to us today about his music and, and how what he does has a resonance for businesses big and small. So without further ado, let's um, see if we can get James on the line. James, are you there? Hey, I'm here. Hey, good to see you, James. Thank you for joining us. I'm really, really delighted that you can join us today. Um, listen, just to get things started, um, I mean, you, you've you had and continue to have, and we've just, I've just in your intro, talked about in your amazing career, um, much of which I follow personally. So uh, I'd love to know, how did it all start? And did you always feel you were destined to be a musician, an artist, and how, how, did, how did it become about? Um, I mean... Initially, from just buying, you know, being into music as a as a teenager, a young young teenager, and then, well, I mean, most of my life, music was very sort of uh, around me because my my father was was a musician and my grandmother oh, yeah. was a musician, and um, so there was always music in you know in our, in our lives, and I got really into it when I started getting into hip hop, sort of around sort of twelve thirteen. And then I started working in record stores and DJing, and then I started a label. And I think as the label started developing, the ideas of what was what was possible became bigger. You know, right. um, I think when when I started, I, I I wanted to really just sort of have an impact on the community that I was into and be like the people that were at the kind of top of that community, and right. especially within sort of. The DJ culture of the time there were certain DJs and certain kind of crews and, and things like that and labels that you would really aspire to try and be part of or be like yeah right um, you know whether it was a you know a soul to soul or a wild bunch or a, you know bomb the bass or you know those kinds of people and then you know DJs like Giles Peterson and you know Cold Cut and um, yeah you know I mean it was so many you know, and there's a lot of things coming from America and, and stuff like that. So I think initially it was just really wanting to be part of that and trying to get, you know, for me, as uh, being a DJ at the time, that was my main focus to try and do as well as I could in, in that world. And as the label grew and the, the sort of reach of the label and all of that stuff, then you start having bigger ideas, you know. Yeah. And, and, and then presumably Moax and then finally Uncle came along. Yeah, in, yeah. In I mean, I, Uncle came along at this time that Moax did because Uncle started at the same time with remixing and stuff like that. Yeah. And then it's sort of been a logo in, in this column that I had in a magazine called Straight Out Chaser. And um, so it had been sort of, it, they, it all kind of came up at a similar time, you know. Um, right. Yeah. And 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 you know you presumably as you grew notoriety and everything else the the impressive array of talent you have had and still have you know working with you I mean did they become a bit of a magnet to come to you then and see what I think I think you go there was definitely waves of that you know I mean at the height of Moax it was a really exciting time and there was a you know what was going on within the generation that I was part of with music in general and particularly in the UK mm. you've got you know, what's going on in all of these kind of scenes that are really starting to kind of make have a bigger impact, whether it's drum and bass, whether it's what's coming out with techno and electronic music, um, what was going on with things like uh, with Moax and the sound that was around at that time and, and those kind of records, you then had, you know, amazing artists, whether it's from the Chemical Brothers to Bjork to Underworld to, yeah. you know, amazing labels. And also you had, you know, what was going on in guitar and rock music. And that was, you know, from whether it was from Radiohead or one side to Oasis and Blur and, and, and everything in between. Um, and you had this amazing influence of what was going on in America, where it was sort of the height of stuff like the Beastie Boys and that kind of world of records. And so it was a really exciting, really exciting time. And to be at the center of that as a kind of label and also generation wise we're all very similar ages yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah. that definitely was a magnet there was there was definitely a lot of sort of um excitement to try and do new things and break down barriers and kind of but also being control and sort of championing all these new movements or what we felt were new movements um and so that point was an incredibly magnetic time, you know, and, and you know, sort of 96 to 98. Yeah. You know. yeah. And I can see what you were saying about, you know, breaking things down and doing things differently. There's a great quote I, I read that you'd made 
I think it was NME which said that uh, you were into the idea of music and art, connecting people, challenging them, but making them feel joy to feel something. So it's not just about sitting back and listening. And I've just, you know, found that with your music and your work over the years myself, you feel immersed into what you do, you know, whether it's an exhibition or it's even even just you know, a, a, a music concert gig or whatever, you feel you're more immersed because of the way you present it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, it's what I love and it's the kind of things that have inspired me. That's what those kind of things do for me. So I'm just trying to kind of find ways to be able to kind of create an environment for all of these different creative things to exist together. You know. so how do you how do you choose the outlets and the platforms for your work? Is it do you have a process, or are you just looking for something new all the time? No, it's not always looking for something new. I think it's 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 it. it there's a combination of of both sort of what what the, the things from the past and how that's influenced you and how you can sort of maybe do interesting things with that side of 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 your you know of of. Um, that part of your creative world and then on on the other side it's trying to do new things and work with new people and but it tends to be very emotionally driven most of the connections tend to come from a kind of con emotional connection as well as a creative connection right um, and, and i guess and then the other quote i was going to mention was uh, you 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 said something about um if i can find it here so he said um, you realise how disposable music is, and as a generalisation, I was intrigued by putting music into different environments and making a record into installation, and the way that people would spend time engaging with the work and its emotion, which is basically what you've said, but I guess that's how... I mean, that's in context of the last exhibition. Yeah, that I mean, that's I what I was going to say, it's yeah. Not really, it's not really an exhibition, it's, it's an experience, really, and it's called Beyond the Road. And, yeah. Um, that was about the idea of and 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 also about um a series of shows that i've done prior to that called um daydreaming with where i think that original quote came from when i did the first daydreaming show the stanley kubrick thing yeah i uh, know before that actually oh, before that right yeah i did one at the museum of mankind at the back of the royal academy um <laughs> and it was where i had a i don't know there was about 20 or plus artists that reacted to the, my music and and the sort of world of uncle and um i was really interested at the time because streaming was becoming really the thing and you know you just sort of music a lot of music had been given away for free digitally and you know there was sort of this feeling that music was just becoming more and more and more disposable and the way that we were engaging with music and we're all guilty of that was sort of becoming less in the way that we did before yeah and so I, I thought you know for me it's really I was trying to find a way of kind of how can you put music in a different environment to get people to have a different sort of attention to that and throughout the sort of last decade or so especially with when it comes to sort of putting together these experiences and these shows and curation I'm really that's what I'm really interested about how you can get people to experience music in, 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 in different ways, but also to have time with music in a way that we don't necessarily so much anymore. It's not to say we don't listen to a lot of music and, you know, but it's it, it there's, we have different habits in the way that we we can take things in. And I think, you know, sitting down and listening to an album from beginning to end or whatever is not as common in now as it was before and yeah, yeah. especially when I'm you know dealing with my daughter and her generation and how they consume music it's interesting to me and I, I just wanted to find ways of like you know if you don't exist for instance an artist like myself where you're in the charts all the time or very much in the public eye or going to be very sort of more in the traditional uh uh, sort of music world that exists as sort of radio da da da, and it's a very pop orientated dynamic now more than it's ever been. Um, music comes and goes very quickly, so I'm trying to. I'm interested in how can I get more time out of the art ones worked on this. You know, you collaborated all these different people, and a lot of that is not just the sound, but it's you know what what's going on with visuals and film and 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 other uh creative experiences and so i just you know i'm really interested in how to kind of put this all these things into an environment where people can spend a different kind of time with it you know 
And I, I guess you know that that's a lesson for me because I've worked in, in newspapers all my life, and and you know newspapers have gone digital in recent years. Um, and the worst thing the news industry ever did was say to everyone, "You can have all this online for free," and now they're sort of trying to monetize it all. Um, which you know some some are doing a very good job of that now as well. But it's it's about repackaging. It's about looking at you know the content you have. How can you can change that? How you can give a better experience? And it is all about the user experience, which in a different sort of way is what you're doing here. It's also you know the process of going to something and being part of something, and it not just all existing on a in 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 a digital digital space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, like that. That 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 um, the the beyond the road thing I thought was fascinating. I think it really was. I, I spent quite a lot of time in there. I felt, as you, as we said earlier, really immersed into the whole thing. And I love the way you actually heard back the music, so it just gives you a different feeling of the music as well as they see and experience in the whole thing as well. It was really really good. I must must say. And for those that didn't see it, I just wanted to give them a flavour for it. That's okay. Just to what was part of the exhibition, which I thought was just. You know, as I say, fascinating. Whether it was this or the whole, maybe you could just talk us through what your inspirations for all this was. Um, well, I worked with um, Colin and Stephen from who kind of are two of the main creative directors of Punch Drunk on this yeah. show. Yeah, and I think for us the idea was to create an experience where. In many ways, it was like going into a an, an album experience where you kind of got to experience everything um, from all of the artwork to the, the, the sort of how you can present things in different environments, how you get a sort of living, breathing. Um, immersive is a kind of a word we're trying to kind of um, sometimes <laughs> avoid, but it, essentially a kind of immersive experience. And from, you know, what they've done in the past, things have always been quite hectic and it's, you know, it's sort of a much more live theatre, very visceral theatre experience. And with this, it was sort of looking at something sort of completely opposite and to try and sort of also create an environment where, so a lot of the, the music is stripped back. There's yeah. all of these different rooms that you go through and the rooms have different artworks relating to the record and this was music from the road part one and two and that period um and it contains artwork from the from the from from the record so there's paintings that were included in the, in the in the album um there were videos that were made there are also different collaborations with different artists that happened over that time. So I worked with Danny Boyle on a, on a TV show, and you know we I, that was trust I, was him on there. Yeah, uh, Alfonso Cuarón on the on Roma on uh, sort of inspired by soundtrack to Roma, and um, all of the music is basically slightly de is deconstructed, and it, there's not really um, it, it's sort of much more um soundscapey and it's more ambient it's less sort of about the drums and the beats and stuff like that so we there was an idea of trying to create a kind of quite a meditative experience um where you could kind of leave the madness behind and go in this journey through all of these different environments which um you you're constantly immersed in music and mm sort of take some time you we the way that we did it we only had groups of about 12 people going in at a time and so you have there's a, it's all about having space yeah i i appreciate it. all of these different I, things kind of come yeah. together through what you're experiencing visually absolutely you know, musically um the sort of kinds of spaces that you're going through, some of the other things that are, that are within the spaces that are connecting to these artworks, smell, um, how light and 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 um, environment work, um, and yeah, we we did the show pre the pandemic, which was quite interesting because it was, you know, the whole pandemic thing was about not you know, having space and not being in tight environments. And we sort of created this, this, <laughs> this exhibition before, um, which was pretty amazing because we then got to then do it actually last year in Korea, 
Um, yes, so yeah, I mentioned that earlier in your intro. Yeah, yeah. 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 In, so how did that come about of all places? <laughs> Um, because a, cur a curator there who um, had seen the show wanted to 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 try and bring it over, yeah. In so, in Seoul, yeah. Yeah, in Seoul, it's, yeah. Which is amazing. A, I've, I've been there. It's a strange place, isn't it? Yeah. It's an amazing place. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I found it a fascinating place. Yeah, I got to the border, the actual DMZ zone, and it was just another world. It was like a movie set. <laughs> yeah, Colin and Stephen went. I unfortunately couldn't go, which was a bit annoying. But um, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. An amazing time. Yeah. So, so, it's, um, so it's a sort of ongoing. It's an ongoing collaboration, and um, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm back to where your, your music has changed and back to uncle's music for a second. I know it's just, you know, probably the early part of this century now, early part of this millennium, <laughs> um, you sort of reinvented the band as Uncle Sounds and then it highlighted them perhaps a more electronic direction the group had taken, you know, different... I mean, at that time, it was sort of, I was around Never Neverland and I was doing yeah. fabric and working with Richard File and we started doing Uncle Sounds as as a residency at Fabric and then doing other yeah. shows outside of that. Yeah, and it's yeah, sort yeah. of us just remixing um, our own records and other records, a lot of sort of re-edits going in. I was playing there every Friday. So, you know, it's kind of this opportunity to constantly try and play and do new things. Um, so, yeah, that was, um, that sort of came out of that. So, so I'm interested to know with with you moving into new things and you obviously changing the music, changing the platforms, pleasing the way your music's presented, etc. Um, we had um, uh, another award-winning uh, musician, Imogen Heap, on the show recently, and she was talking about using things like blockchain and using it for things like ticket sales or determining where to tour and opening up the fan base to things like what she's reading, what clothes she's wearing. Is any of that important to you? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of interesting stuff going on with technology and yeah. I'm sort of just seeing how things are developing, it, particularly when it comes to stuff like the blockchain and how that can work with music. Yeah, and, 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 and metaverse as well. I mean, where, where do you think that is? Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, you know, the, the metaverse is really interesting. I work with two artists that are very, very involved in that and sort of we've been talking about ideas for the last few years. And again, it's just sort of seeing how things develop. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of wild west stuff going on in certain places. And then you've kind of got, you know, this, the idea of how these things can really benefit creativity and ownership and, and how you can obviously reach people and, and, and communicate. And I think, you know, it's it's interesting times, you know, and it's definitely something that um keeping an eye on and in, in sort of seeing where it's going. I'm sort of, you know, been going back and forth with ideas for a while, but um, yeah. we'll see. And, and presumably, you know, this, what we're just about to show, this snippet of here, this now, this was a, a fascinating evening, as I said, at the start. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, did, you, did you come up with this concept? No, no, I'd never um, seen it. Like invited, it. To, we'd invited to do the show, and there were these really great visual artists working. I can't remember their names, um, and they created this cube idea that different artists would perform within, and it could become a cube or the way the screens they could sort of move around. And yeah, I, I think I saw Tom Walker there the following night doing something different with it. Yeah, but you know, we you know I've been lucky to have a lot of amazing visual content over the years so it was this brilliant opportunity to really use that as this kind of um, canvas for all of this different video yeah. well i'd seen nothing like that until that night and i've got to yeah. say it was just amazing it blew me away that night i'm so glad there was a recording of it to keep and watch that because i've seen it back so many many times now yeah no oh, really, it's really good it's really good so just looking at the future i mean you, you, I, I saw you recently you you at this show here uh, yeah which was an I thought an amazing new venue as well. I mean, I, I, I did, what was that before? I'd never seen this place before. Out in it. Um, it was. I mean, it's under. It's totally underneath Denmark Street. So I'm not sure what it was. I think it's custom. I think they built it. You know, it's a, that was a great venue as well. I mean, it's like four stories below Denmark Street, right in the yeah, centre of London. Which uh, uh, it was a fascinating night as well. So, so what is is how are you how are you going to shape your 
career going forward? Are there going to be more of this sort of stuff? Are there going to be more installations or? Uh, good question. Um, well, I'm looking at what we're going to try and do live wise over the next year and we'll see. Um, I am, you know, working um, on various different projects that I'm seeing hopefully may come to fruition, some that I've already been involved with that are sort of developing. Um, and I'm writing new music, so, yeah. Well, I think I was going to ask you, really, I mean, a lot of people that listen to this show, not only music fans, because as I said, we've had lots of music artists on and, and, and industry captains and media and, and technology and stuff, but a lot of the audience are, you know, small and medium enterprise. I'm just thinking if you were an SME listening or watching to your story today, you know, I feel you couldn't fail to be inspired because, you know, what, what message would you relate to those in these difficult times? I mean, a message of reinvention, perhaps, and continuous improvement and development and getting your communication out to different channels, perhaps? What, what would you think if you yeah, were? I mean, I, th I, I think community is really important and how you kind of build on that. I think depth of ideas and trying to always look for new ways of doing things and um, you know the looking at how you learn and you know there's a there's a lot of amazing history out there and how you can sort of take from that and and create new ideas. Um, I think you know believing in, in you know quality and truth and craft all of those things is really important yeah. and i think you know it's it's you know that what's amazing now and what I, i've always believed in is that you can you know that it anything is possible if you really try and so you know to to try and find a way to believe in yourself and to to you know try and have that confidence is really important and to find ways to you know always you know try and surround yourselves with people that are going to support you and yeah, right. What we're doing, you know. It, it's funny again going back to some of my media background. It, it's true that because, you know, I think I've always found that getting media companies to work together, people that know their shit, basically, but um, it's difficult because in the past it's always been our politics and personalities getting in the way. But I think the pandemic, in a bizarre sort of way, has sort of broken those barriers down, and people want to communicate with each other more, want to work with each other. People are more kind to each other, dare I say? Yeah, totally. <laughs> yes. and and you know, it's about working hard. You've got to work hard, you know. Yeah. Put the time. Uh, in. Yeah. And I know it's a cliche question, James, but what would a, what would today's James Lavelle say to himself as an 18 year old? Would he have changed anything? Would he, would he do anything different? Then? I think probably slow down at the time, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great question because it's stuff I see you getting involved with. Like, where do you get a chance to even breathe sometimes? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, but it's about living it. And that's the other thing, you know, I think you've got to live what, what, you know, if you really believe in what you're doing and, and you have the opportunity to, to do that. And I think it's, a, you know, it's really important that you live that and really, you know, I, I, my work is, is what I live for, you know? Yeah. Um, and I love doing what I do and I'm very grateful and lucky to be able to do some of the things that I can do, you know, but I, I don't really know what else to do. It's what I live, you know, it's what I, it's sort of, it's just, you have to live it, you know? Well, I hope you keep on doing it for years to come, mate. Because I, I love, I love it. Everything you've done, I think it's great. So um, thank, you. thank you for those experiences you've you've you shared with me. <laughs> I've got a final question for you. Am I right in saying that you've got thirty thousand records tucked away somewhere? There's a lot, yeah, in storage, <laughs> slowly being gone through at the moment. It's, uh, oh my goodness! <laughs> lost art, yeah. Well, there's the retirement project. But it's it's definitely going to be, um, it's, yeah. It's there's a there's a there's a lot to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, listen. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's an inspiration what you've done, and I hope it is yeah, an inspiration for the people listening. Thank you very right. much for joining us, James. I'll Cheers, see you again bye. soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye for now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. That's today's show. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. Um, we'll be back again very soon. I'll be back in the new year. In fact, we have the break for Christmas now, and we'll see you again in the new year. In the meantime, take care and bye for now.